absolutely fascinating, and I hope that you do too. It is a theory of Planet X, Nibiru, and Wormwood. Now, worm, as you know, uh, in the Bible, Wormwood is a it, it's mentioned in Revel, the Book of Revelations, actually, uh, and uh, it's a translation. Uh, I guess it is from it, the it's from Greek. The, the Greek text is Absinthos, Absinthos, and that translates into English as Wormwood, and uh, that's the English language version of the Bible. And there, there are other. You know, other languages have, uh, like Hebrew in the Old Testament, uh, la, la'ana, which means curse, and that um, means the same thing in Arabic and Hebrew. Now, the, the only clear reference that, the, the name in, that this named entity occurs in the New Testament is in the book of Revelations. And uh, the, the quote is, The third angel sounded his trumpet, and a great star, blazing like a torch, fell from the sky on a third of the rivers, and on the springs of water, the name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters turned bitter, and many people died from the waters that had become bitter. And that's uh, in Revelation, Revelations 8, 10, and 11. Now, that could be that that can mean a lot of things. Uh, you know, there I've heard people meant I've heard it being interpreted as well back when I was growing up uh, during the. I don't know if you'd call it the height of the Cold War, or as the Cold War was winding down in the 60s and 70s, uh, a lot of people thought that meant, you know, ICBMs coming from the Soviet Union, you know, the mutually assured destruction, you know, we launch, they launch, they launch, uh, we launch, and uh, the whole world uh, gets annihilated uh, in thermonuclear war. And so that that could be one uh, person's interpretation of a great star falling from the sky, Others could be a meteorite, a comet, an asteroid. Could be a spaceship, like a giant kamikaze spaceship. You know, who knows? There's a, there's a lot of different, and that that can be interpreted in a lot of different ways. But you know, something falling from the sky uh, and turn the waters bitter doesn't necessarily mean. I mean, it could mean it poisoned the water. Um, I mean, if if you've seen seen the movies, and sometimes you come, you wonder, has Hollywood been conditioning us with like the the movies with the alien invasions and occupation of planet Earth, um, movies like Armageddon and Deep Impact, where uh, these giant asteroids and comets uh, basically were going to cause an extinction level event, and you know, well, only in Hollywood could something like that be averted. Um, in real life, I don't think I don't think so, and. You know, depending on your your school of uh, beliefs, no one knows who's right, no one knows who's wrong. Could have been created 6,000 years ago, uh, the universe could be 6,000 years old, or it could be billions of years old. Who knows? Who knows what really wiped out the dinosaurs? The, the prevailing theory, and let me stress that word theory, is, uh, you know, the, before they discovered the crater down on the Yucatan Peninsula, the prevailing belief was that they died from, I think, volcanic eruptions. And then the prevailing theory once that, that, that giant crater had been discovered was that um, an asteroid had hit the Earth some 65 million years ago, and that wiped out the dinosaurs. <clears throat> and uh, all you've got to do is look at the surface of the moon, and you can see that it's been hit by a lot of things. and Or that could be have been old volcanic eruptions. Who knows for sure what uh, none of us are really there to see it, <laughs> so who knows what the truth is? But doing my research, I, I wanted to not use my speculation and observation uh, because you know I'm just a I dabble in astronomy because you know it's just fascinating to me. But anyways, I wanted to you know read through different different publications and sites and try to find something you know that I would basically say would be. Could, you know, compelling. Uh, and this this one this this one article I found is on a site called KRSChannel.com, and it says, "Does Planet Nibiru exist? And is Nibiru approaching?" Uh, we've all heard the, well, I don't know if we all have, but you know, a lot of people have heard, you know, that this could be happening. But anyways, uh, th this is what they have to say about it. The, the new information on Nibiru is more mysterious than its own origins. Not too many people know the true details of Nibiru and why it exists in our solar system. Uh, so this, the author 
uh, basically wants to give you some information. Now, let me tell you some basics first about this planet. Planet Nibiru, which was referred by the Sumerians as Planet X, was supposedly the 12th planet in our solar system. And the true meaning of Planet Nibiru is Planet of Crossing. In the hydrophilic of the Sumerians and Egyptian, they talked about how Planet Nibiru had an elliptical orbit, had an elliptical orbit uh, as opposed to our normal horizontal orbit. And it took around 750,000 years to come between Mars and Jupiter. And when it did, it created this, the, this created devastation on all the planets during its flyby. Uh, archaeologists Zachariah Sitchin and Burak Eldam also suggested that this planet, which looks a lot like CR-105, uh, with the similar orbit. However, the crossing path of CR-105 is very different than Nibiru or Planet X. Nibiru's 80% of orbit lies much further from the Sun, where CR-105's orbit is 60% away from the Sun and 40% near, uh, near the rest of the planets. And according to historians, uh, Tiamat, Tiamat, a planet which had lain between Mars and Jupiter around 510 million years ago, was a victim of Planet X as Tiamat collided with one of the moons of Nibiru. It crashed, broke into half, and as and as one half became the asteroid belt, the other half became Phobos, uh, Mars, uh, uh, of the moon of Mars. And uh, the, while the other half is our home, planet Earth, out of destruction comes life. And that's a quote from a Hindu ancient text, um, Bhagavad Gita. Now, this planet has known to be, and you know, it depends on who you ask, uh, 20 times bigger than Ju Jupiter with a burning moon, which acts like Nibiru's personal sun. And since Nibiru goes much further away from our sun, the theory actually makes sense and stands out. Uh, the, Anu, the Anunnaki, who are supposedly citizens of Nibiru, came to planet Earth around 25,000 years ago and gave a lot of knowledge and detail to the developing humanoids, whom at the time didn't have the brain capacity or thinking power to comprehend what the Anun Anunnaki were saying. Uh, even the Mayans had predicted the existence of Nibiru, uh, and according to them, a certain dark energy in the shape of a planet, which will be coming near Earth in the distant future. Now, every time this planet came around, entire the entire civilization of Earth was wiped out. Now, James McCaney, as an expert on planet Nibiru and the Mayan his and Mayan history, explained that around 10,000 years ago, major devastation occurred, which which uh, destroyed many of the civilizations on our planet. And he also explained how ruined cities in South America were vanished, um, not because of war or plague, but major physical destruction here on Earth. And he also went on to say that before Nibiru passed by us 10,000 years ago, the North Pole was somewhere in the state of Wisconsin, while the South Pole was somewhere in the Pacific Ocean. Now, if he's right, and this event did occur because of Planet X or Nibiru, and we shouldn't worry about it for the next 740,000 years or so, right? Well, no. Even as Nibiru crossed its path from between Jupiter and Mars, uh, it's now surging upwards to make its longest route around the sun, and that's due to the fact that its elliptical orbit goes in a roundabout very close to the sun on one end, while 80% of orbit is really far away from the sun, and that's why the earthquake that is why the earthquake that happened in Japan and Chile and other places could be due to the fact that the magnetic pull from Nibiru is increasing as it nears our plane, and the pull from Nibiru will increase gravitational force of each planet in, like, in a rubber band type effect, uh, so, and, and you're not going to find this on Wikipedia, but as far as uh, the Mayan 2012 doomsday theory is concerned, um, well, it's 2015, so that didn't happen uh, but uh, anyways, uh, you know, Nibiru will not be showing up this fast because even though the earthquakes are happening and floods are taking place, like what happened in Japan a couple of years ago, it's still a good 10 years away where the naked eye can detect it. And now, while, now as the, with that being said, I, I saw some video footage of um, what appeared to be like two suns and why I never saw this, actually. I mean, well, it, it happened like, you know, right at sun up, and well, m most of the time I'm asleep uh, at sun up because I work really late at night, so I got to rest. But you know, that's one theory of of that. I mean, again, we don't know if this is true or not. You know, I've listened to a lot of uh, you know, I listened to Coast to Coast AM a lot um, back in the 90s and early 2000s when I was doing a lot of um, 
a lot of a lot of shows and you know i would be getting back from shows really late at night uh the studio really late at night or you know rehearsals really late at night and i listen to coast to coast am and it was fascinating and i became a fan of the show and i still am so there there's a lot of um to me it's fascinating other people i i may have put people to sleep uh, i may have scared the living daylights out of you uh, don't let that happen because none of we don't know if this is true or not i mean everyone has to make their own draw your own conclusions and do your own research i always say that don't don't take my word for it because i'm not an expert at anything uh but you know i do have some audio uh to you know to kind of back up what i'm saying there and again all of this information will be posted on our website the wakeupmissionshow.com and on our facebook page uh the wake up mission radio show so if you want to check these links out later uh, feel free to do so do your own research draw your own conclusions it could be true and then again it might not be you know who the hell knows well if it is you know we'll all find out together but anyways i, I do have some audio and, and uh, most of the audio that i found you know were really long you know like two hours and stuff like that well we don't have two hours and those files are too large to upload anyway so i just had to sit you know sift through a lot of different audio to find what what i thought was good quality audio that would actually fit into our time frame so we'll, we'll go ahead and uh, get started on this one uh, i want to stop uh the audio uh to just clarify these dates they didn't specify the year and uh, if it was this year or last year well it, it didn't happen and this is all just speculation but i did want to i had put that in my notes uh, also to make sure i clarified that so uh We'll go ahead and uh, uh, let this continue. We always well, now that ain't that a pain. Well, it won't let me advance so the recording. I guess uh, it doesn't have a pause. It's just stop and then it resets. Well, anyways, I, I while during my research on this, I, f I found this fascinating um, interview with this guy. Uh, he he, li he lived in uh, Puerto Rico. And he, he claimed to have been um, abducted by aliens, and, and they had uh, given him a pretty dire warning. And I, I thought this was really fascinating. So let's let's go ahead and get to this one. I, I'm going to this one. It's a little longer, and I'm going to go ahead and let this play. I, I'm not going to stop it because, uh, well, <laughs> we just saw what happened. Once it stopped, it stops. You can't. It doesn't pause. On the morning of May 14, 1988, Amori Riviera, a young man from Puerto Rico, photographed a giant disc, followed and circled by two jet interceptors. What makes the sensational pictures even more interesting is Riviera's claim that he had contact with the occupants of this UFO. Hello, my name is uh, Amori Rivera. Este, I live in Puerto Rico. And back in 1988, uh, I was working in a nightclub, and... Uh, there was a, a musical group there. One of my cousins wanted me to photograph the musical group, and she loaned me a camera with some film. On my way back home, uh, I encountered uh, two small uh, beings, two small strange men, which I didn't think were uh, men from outer space. And, and they took me somewhere where there were other people uh, besides myself, uh, other human people like from Puerto Rico, I guess. Uh, from here, another human being showed up. He claimed to be from a distant planet. He was dressed in black. He had a uh, dark skin, but he was he was not a Negro. He had a uh, uh, black, long black hair up to the shoulders, and he spoke to us uh, with the mouth uh, verbally and not no telepathic speaking. Uh, he showed us uh, various uh, uh, projections, uh, which looked uh, very real. The projections, and he informed us about a whole bunch of things that are even still incredible to me. Uh, then uh, he, they returned me to... What did this holographic projection show? Uh, the holographs uh, were mainly... Uh, the first one that I can remember was a, like a short trip uh, through space. Uh, we saw where he, he came from, where he said to be from. We saw his people, we saw his, his, the houses that they used. And the second one was about... Uh, a uh, meteor or a rock uh, falling to earth in the near future which is going to cause a lot of um, havoc in in the world this would fall in, it's going to fall in a, very near the the caribbean puerto rico and those um, other small islands but it's going to affect the whole world not just uh, puerto rico 
the last one is, is uh, that they projected it was uh, showing us how there was only going to be one government on, on the planet Earth. Uh, they'll be living on some sort of artificial island that, that's going to be floating in the middle of a dark, black, uh, dirty sea. Uh, and then uh, this man uh, returned me uh, to uh, my to my car again and left me somewhere different from where I, the whole uh, ordeal had started. Apparently, they uh, it took me with car and all. Uh, after this, at this given time, I l heard some jets in the sky and I still had my cousin's camera and I took uh, the pictures, uh, four of which are ma I'm making public nowadays. So the jets followed the UFO? Yes, it was. Uh, they seemed to be uh, uh, surveilling it. Uh, I only got to uh, capture just one of the, the, the jets in the photograph, but there were actually there were three of them. Uh, or, or maybe I got in one of the photos one, and in the second or third I got one of the other ones, because they would go around it very far away, and while this one was closer, and turn, you know, very far, very far. And by the time this one was coming back, another one was turning over there. There was always one or the other close to the, to the object, to the UFO. Jürgen Martin has carefully investigated this case. Jorge Rivera's case, is, to me, is a very special one and a very important one, because uh, in a Morris case, he was abducted and he was taken away by aliens. One of them was human-like and two small creatures that they explained to him were some type of uh, genetical or biological organic android that they made to do some chores outside so they don't have to uh, risk themselves in our environment. That's what they explained to him, the so-called human alien that he saw in the craft. And it's important also because of the evidences that he has on the case, because when he was released, he had a camera with him and he was able to take pictures of the object that apparently had abducted him, the craft, flying saucer type, and also some jet fighters from the United States, <coughs> excuse me, F-14 again. In most of these cases in the island, F-14s are involved with these situations of chasing and harassment and, and checking on these objects when they are seen in the different areas of the island. And they, he was able to get them in those pictures together. So this clearly, when you see those photographs, it's obvious that the government has been lying for many years because there's the UFO there, and there's also the jet fighters dealing with the situation, which they denied for more than four years. It's there. Were you able to locate any other witnesses? That's what I was going to, to explain at this moment, Michael. Uh, the Amoris case is also very important because I have other several people who apparently had been contacted by the same alien that abducted Amori and the small ones that were with him, in a, di in a separate uh, fashion, they have nothing to do with the Morris incident. This being, this human-like alien, is contacting people all around the area of the southwest of Puerto Rico. I have people from the town of Yauco who seem to have been contacted by this man. I have this fisherman, Andres Maldonado, uh, who I got in contact with Amori because he told me several things Amori had told no one before, only I knew them, about the name of the alien and all the details that he was using to check on the people who really may have been in contact with the same being the night he was abducted because there were about 14 other people there in the craft that night. And when Mandonado told me all this information that he couldn't know because it was, he was not involved with the Morris case, uh, I got them together. And at this moment I have about three different people who seem to have been in contact with the same alien. So they are doing something and they are getting in contact with more and more people and preparing people for something. And this is very important because all this corroborates a Morris incident also. Other witnesses contacted Amori himself. Uh, so far, uh, between 1988 and 1992, I've been able to localize seven of these people uh, because I've gone on different uh, uh, TV shows and uh, uh, different articles, and I've, uh, I've always uh, been asking if anybody remembers anything similar happening to them and that year, during that time, Mother's Day, to please get in touch with me. And I have gotten in touch with hundreds of people, but out of the hundreds, uh, seven definitely were there uh, with me. I still have uh, seven to go. Maybe I'll never uh, find them. Maybe, maybe they'll see this. You investigated the Rivera case, Colonel Stevens. What was your impression? Well, of course, Jorge Martin took me to meet Jorge Rivera, or, uh, Amari Rivera, uh, shortly after I got there with the Mexican team to study some phenomena in Puerto Rico. And... When I first met Amari, he was very uh, reluctant to describe his case because it still frightened him to think about it. And it took 
some time before we could uh, develop enough confidence where he was comfortable talking to us about the case. But he would still tremble when he thought about it. He would, would turn pale. He'd become weak. He, uh, uh, he was frightened. But he has now reviewed the details and the points in sufficient length and depth that he can, can face the experience without the trauma, which he has, has learned to do. And today, or yesterday, we saw for the first time that he is able to, to manage his emotions well enough to describe that contact in considerable detail. You carefully analyzed the Rivera photographs. We took the pictures, yes. We took the pictures taken by Amari Rivera to a NASA, consult a NASA consultant facility in Scottsdale where we put them through a computer analysis using the latest state-of-the-art equipment. And we found that both the disc-shaped craft seen in the photographs and the aircraft are sub considerable distance from the camera between three and five miles. We discovered that the jet fighter was moving and that the disc-shaped craft was moving relatively slow or not moving at all. We discovered that uh, the ambient light conditions were correct in all respects. We were able to eliminate montages, paste-ups, reflections, models, all kinds of forms of technical uh, manipulation of photographs. And we had to conclude that the pictures were real and that they were exactly as described by the witness when he took the photographs. Noch dazu wurde Amuri Rivera eingeschüchtert und unter Druck gesetzt, seine Fotos herauszugeben. Well, a, a short time after, after the, the incident, a, a three men uh, showed up at my home in Puerto Rico, and one of them stood in their car downstairs. And uh, they claimed to be uh, from a CIA. And they gave me, they handed me two pieces of paper, which I was so nervous I couldn't really read, but I remember seeing the, the letter CIA, which is uh, the intelligence agency from the United States, and uh, they said that it would be easier and better for me if I handed them the photographs and the negatives. But they did not say, you know, what photographs or what negatives. Uh, they didn't specify. And I just told them that I did not know what they were talking about. And they said it, it would be easier because we have at the, uh, an order for to register your house, to look through your house. And I said, well, go ahead, be my guest and look. And they, they looked, but they couldn't find them because I had, I had hit them very well. Well, is this guy full of it, uh, looking for his 15 minutes, or was he telling the truth? Well, we, you know, who knows? Um, you know, he seems to be very convinced of his experience that it actually did happen. And if you want to see this, um, you know, if you want to see this interview with him for yourself, then, you know, go to our website, the wake up mission show.com or our Facebook page, the wake up mission radio show. All this information is posted there and you can check it out for yourself and draw your own conclusions. Uh, but one thing I wanted to interject before we um, get back uh, to Nibiru I've seen, you know, watching like Science Channel, Discovery, and and what have you, uh, what the shows with aliens, and uh, they, you know, one one thing that most of the scientists do agree upon is, you know, for long distance space travel, you know, carbon based organic life forms don't fare too, wouldn't fare too well, uh, unless you know they had like some kind of faster, you know, some way to travel long distances over short periods of time, like wormholes faster than light, warp speed, whatever you want to call it. And that, you know, artificial, if you want to call them robots, androids, or what have you, well, they had theorized that, you know, when people talk about their experiences with abductions with the greys, that the greys aren't actually, uh, well, they, they may be sentient life forms, but the greys are actually these, like, like what this guy was explaining, the greys are actually, you know, like an artificial biomechanical um, life. So that I, I thought that was interesting when he mentioned that when I when they said you know they do like you know menial tasks and, and chores that wouldn't be safe for a carbon based organic life form so you know I just thought oh okay that kind of connects those dots and that's what we try to do here and again this is all just theory could be true could could not be we we don't know none of us were there <clears throat> but it's a fascinating subject well for me anyway. So, um, you know, when I, you know, doing more research I, uh, on this website called Inquisitor, 
um, th this just happened back this past January. And uh, it said that, uh, has science just admitted Planet X and Nibiru exist? And believers uh, say that full, you know, the people that believe this, you know, wholeheartedly, they they think that full disclosure is coming. And you know, we've, you know, we, we we've been wrong about other things, but you know, when you think about like in the audio earlier where the guy was talking about, you know, the the DoD employees being told to get prepared to bug out, you know, the underground tunnels, all that, um, you know, it kind of ties in. You know, maybe you know Jade Helm was not. You know, the cover story was it was going to be training for, you know, dealing with domestic terrorism when it's actually uh, dealing with uh, a global cataclysm. I mean, you know, we we don't know. But anyways, uh, uh, from this article that um, John Thomas, uh, what, did it, Didymus, I guess that's how you say that, D-I-D-Y-M-U-S. Well, anyways, he, he says that astronomers, astronomers, <laughs> may have inadvertently revived uh, the Planet X Nibiru um, conspiracy. Because this, this has dominated the Internet a few years ago. It kind of kicked up when that uh, meteorite, um, you know, went, you know, went um, you know, hit in Russia a couple years ago. Well, anyways, following a lot of the announce announcements by scientists uh, uh, of evidence that there are at least two planets larger than Earth in our solar system beyond Pluto, uh, well, it... Um, they say that uh, the you know the believers of this system, oh, well, the Planet X neighborhood cataclysm believers have been saying that their governments are preparing to disclose the truth um, to the masses. And they, uh, and scientists, had announced in a new study published in the in the journal Monthly Notices of the Royal Astronomical Society letters that there is at least two planets likely bigger than Earth that are undetected in the outer fringes of the solar system, and they are thought to exist beyond the orbits of Neptune and Pluto. Now, according to Professor Carlos de la Fuente Marcos from the Com Complutense University of Madrid, who led the study, the evidence supporting the conclusion comes from observations of a belt of space rocks known as the Extreme Trans-Neptunian Objects, or ETNOS, orbiting the sun beyond Neptune, and these rocks were found they were found to show an unexpected, unexpected orbital characteristics that can be explained only by assuming that their expected paths are being distorted by some massive uh, but unseen astronomical body nearby. And uh, it was quoted to say, "In the excess of objects with unexpected orbital parameters, makes us believe there are some invisible forces are altering the dis distribution of the orbital elements of the Etno." And we consider that the most probable explanation is that other unknown planets exist beyond Neptune and Pluto, and the exact number is uncertain, given that the data is limited, uh, but our calculations suggest that there are at least two planets and probably more within the confines of our solar system. Now, the term Planet X, it, it has its origin among astronomers in the period after the discovery of Neptune in 1846. And after Neptune was discovered, several astronomers speculated there, that there might still be another planet beyond Neptune, and Percival Lowell proposed the Planet X hypothesis to explain observed irregularities in the orbits of uh, Uranus and Neptune. Now, at first, the astronomers thought they had found Planet X when Pluto was discovered in 1930 by Clyde Tombaugh, but they soon realized that Pluto was too small to explain the observed effects on Uranus and Neptune, because these two planets are gas giants. They're not as large as Jupiter or Saturn, but they're a lot bigger than Earth. They're, they're, they're huge planets. Um, well, anyways, this realization sparked a renewed search for Planet X, and it was abandoned in the 90s after analysis of measurements of Neptune attained from the Voyager 2 suggested that the inaccuracies in the estimation of the mass of Neptune could explain the observed inconsistencies in uh, the Uranus orbit and that they kind of just abandoned the hypothesis. But uh, the discovery of hundreds of so-called trans-Neptunian objects, or TNOs, and most of which were identified as part of the Kuiper, the Kuiper belt, um, consisting mainly of icy bodies with orbit orbits similar to Pluto's. And it led Pluto to being demoted um, from the status of a planet uh, to a dwarf planet and a member of the Kuiper belt. Well, I, I've actually heard this lady on Coast to Coast AM, Nancy Leader, and uh, she's a fascinating interview. Um, um, uh, well, back in the 90s when they were giving up on this, um, Nancy Leader founded a website called Zeta Talk and claimed she was in contact with extraterrestrials 
from the Zeta Reticuli star system, and she proclaims that she's been instructed to warn mankind that a large planetary body she called Planet X uh, would pass into the inner solar system and, and cause our planet to undergo a pole shift that will destroy civilization. And she also claims that Planet X, it's about four times the size of Earth, uh, would arrive in May of 27 of 2003 with catastrophic consequences. Well, here we are 12 years later. That didn't happen. And others who had adopted her idea associated it with the uh, December 21, 2012 Mayan apocalypse. Well, that didn't happen. And they adopted the term Nibiru. Um, and it's originally a technical term in ancient Babylonian astronomy but derived from, but uh, and it was, but it was basically derived from internet doomsday cults from the work of Soviet-born American writer Zechariah Sitchin, who claimed that civilization was originated by the Anunnaki, uh, that race of people that they believe they believe uh, ex exists from planet Nibiru. Uh, well, the identification of leaders Planet X uh, seemed natural due to Sitchin's theory in his book The Twelfth Planet that ancient Babylonian lore indicates there is an undiscovered planet called Nibiru beyond Neptune and the Anunnaki live there. And well, after the efforts to debunk the, the theory uh, by emphasizing that science itself has abandoned its earlier quest for Planet X, the revival of the scientific Planet X will inevitably help to re-energize the doomsday movement. So here we are again. <laughs> um, so that, you know, there, there there's, um, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of talk, you know, it's been met with ridicule and even by those that spent, you know, hours studying in, in, in an attempt to debunk it only to, to find that they are now believers and there are evident stirrings of feelings of vindication among these cataclysm believers who have long insisted that the government uh, had been covering up the truth about the existence of this planet. So I guess we'll all find out together, you know, again, you know, there's nothing set in stone and th th this is all fascinating stuff, but um I wanted to um, run some audio uh, because if this really isn't happening, why are they talking about it? Um, and it's not necessarily this subject, but uh, uh, I don't know when this occurred, but they, they were talking about, you know, this particular type of event in Congress. Uh, so uh, take a listen. Thanks for watching YouTube. So this was some uh, good work here. Thank you, Marcy. Great catch. Appreciate you passing this on. This is from uh, Third Rock from the Sun. TV show back in, uh, I think this is 1996. This is the first season. I used to like this show, actually. Not too bad. Anyway, take a listen. And yet everyone on the planet gets all worked up about these pointless little behaviors, blissfully unaware of the great vaporizing meteor due in 2015. <laughs> Which obviously doesn't exist because I'm kidding. He detected uh, even a small one, uh, like the one that uh, detonated in, in Russia, um, headed for New York City in three weeks, what would we do? Bend over and what? No, I, I, Congressman, I, you know, that is, um, I don't, again, I have to go back to what I said before. These are, th these are very rare events. Uh, from the information that we have on, um, on asteroids that we've discovered of all sizes, we don't know of one that, that will threaten the population of the United States, you know, in three weeks. Um, and we are trying very diligently, as I said before, with the President's budget to put ourselves in a position where we advance the technology such that three weeks will not be something that causes us to panic because we will be able to respond. We are where we are today because, you know, you all told us to do something and, and, it, and between the administration and the Congress, the funding to do that did not, the bottom line has always the funding did not come, and, and, and I don't care whose fault it is or, or if it's anybody's fault. We all know what we're facing today, and we're all sitting here today as the Congress and the administration try to figure out sequestration, something that never should have happened, nobody planned to happen, but we're facing it today. And so the answer to you is if it's coming in three weeks, uh, pray. And I, I second that, that motion uh, from this gentleman. Be prepared because, you know, uh, the, there's really no way to prove or disprove any of this. And it's, again, it's a fascinating subject. There are thousands of, well, I don't know, but thousands may be a stretch, but there's a lot of hours of audio of, of this on YouTube. Um, and I've got one other clip. I'm not going to play the whole thing. And it, it was uh, said that it was from a NASA whistleblower. And a lot of it was more visual than audio because they were showing like some underground 
uh, tunnels and structures that have been built. Uh, but uh, he does have some, you know, some fairly legitimate information. So we'll, we'll play a few minutes of this. The panic and the havoc seen in the Russian Urals last winter when a meteor the size of a house exploded in the skies, well, we could be set for a repeat. Scientists say the huge rock might not have been flying solo as first thought, but rather as part of a group of asteroids which still pose a threat to Earth. Artie's Lindsay France now joining me live to, uh, to tell us uh, more about this. Uh, Lindsay, good to see you. Oh gosh, let the panic begin. But before we get into what could be what some are already calling the buddies of this asteroid <laughs> that came down earlier this year, can you remind us exactly what happened back in February? Yeah, that's right, Rory. Who can forget? Uh, the, the asteroid on the 15th of February hit around 9.20 local time. Uh, an 11,000 ton rock, 80, uh, 18 meters wide, crashed into Chelyabinsk, of course, the mountains that separate Europe and Asia. We've got some sound of what the Russian dash camera, so widely used in this country, actually caught uh, that very uh, important morning, February 15th. Let's listen to what we've got. Very dramatic video there, uh, and, and when that story came out, people were very, very shocked because we all wanted to know why it wasn't detected, and it scared, obviously, a lot of people. No one was killed in this. Uh, more than a 1,000 were injured, but no one lost their lives, and that was what uh, was such a shock to so many in this situation, and that is the fear is this went undetected. So that's why scientists are trying to figure out if there are more, possibly, uh, on, on their way. I mean, certainly, Lindsay, it was an early morning, early morning commute when this was going of on. Uh, you were at work. I was here at work as mm -hmm. well. Bloggers were going ballistic mm -hmm. over this. And when you were just showing the footage there of windows exploding from buildings there, I suppose the sonic boom or whatever mm -hmm. it is, I mean, this was a monster. It was huge. And it caused massive chaos and a fair amount of panic as well. The, the dash cam videos are just absolutely startling. But the news today, Lindsay, is apparently that monster rock may not have been alone. Exactly. Now, it is what scientists are calling sibling asteroids. And here's how it works. So, uh, as I mentioned, the, the asteroid went undetected, obviously frightening everyone. And so what scientists did is they ran, uh, they ran uh, simulate, billions of simulations to find uh, sibling asteroids that may have been on a similar orbital path to the one that hit in Chelyabinsk. Look at that. It's just astonishing. And uh, what they found is nearly 20 different uh, asteroids that are on this, si this similar path. Uh, they, they span between five and 200 meters across, and they could uh, one day follow their sibling to Earth if uh, scientists, uh, if, if they are actually following uh, this, this asteroid on, on its similar path. Now, scientists do think it broke up, the large asteroid itself broke up about 40,000 years ago, creating all of these other rocks that are floating through space. But don't panic just yet, because scientists do also say that they haven't gotten a good two-year chunk of time to monitor these asteroids. They've only, only gotten a very short and they just keep going on about that. Now, the research that I did about uh, Nibiru um, and Wormwood uh, were, you know, these could, one thing uh, that a lot of, one of the main consensus that I found was that it has a lot of, uh, Nibiru or Wormwood has a lot of junk floating around with it. It's not coming by itself if it is. And, you know, these asteroid events that, periodically occur. I mean, if you think back, uh, the Tunguska event, I mean, that was almost, um, that was around 100 years ago, and that was pretty gnarly and massive, uh, hit out in uh, Siberia. Well, 100 years in geologic and space time, that's like a blink of an eye. Um, but anyways, one of the theories of Wormwood is there is an entire solar system, which uh, some people who uh, believe in Nibiru um, uh, has its own sun and uh, other planets and moons coming with it, and that that's going to pass through our solar system, and there could be a lot of disruption if, if this actually did happen. It could, well, you know, but, you know, change the face of the solar system and could wipe out planet Earth. I mean, you know, look at the asteroid belt and the Kuiper belt. Could that be evidence from earlier collisions? Um, with uh, the Wormwood event uh, or the Nibiru event, <clears throat> was the asteroid belt actually uh, a planet at one at one time? Was the Kuiper belt uh, a full planet at one time? You have to think about all these things. And, you know, like we were all up in arms about Jade Helm 15. That could have just been an exercise, like I would mentioned earlier, and a cover story. Um, you know, like Mars, uh, you know, there's, conspir there, there's theories that uh, Mars has already been colonized. Could at one time Mars have had, um, you know, civilization? I mean, uh, that uh, just a few weeks ago they, you know, came out and said that, well, we found water on Mars. 
well, at one time, was Mars like Earth? Did civilization exist there? Uh, and since we're obviously, um, you know, have been told that we're aiming to go back to Mars, could it be to recolonize Mars and figure out a way to do some type of terraforming to make it a habitable planet? Because it may, you know, Earth might be in the crosshairs um, of planet X Nibiru. Um, you know, who, who knows? I mean, it, uh, all of this, it, it's all just, you know, theory, conjecture. It's, uh, I mean, it could be factual. It just could be a bunch of a bunch of nut jobs. <laughs> but, uh, anyways, we are coming up to the top of the hour. Um, and uh, you know, this is this type of subject. Uh, you know, I, I could do a month of shows on this, but we don't have time. We have to move on. Uh, so again, you know, go to our website and check out the information for yourself. Um, so that 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 kind of concludes uh, this hour, this first hour, and I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I think it's fascinating, but uh, we're going to take a break, and then in a, in a few minutes, uh, uh, we'll have uh, uh, our guest for today, Randy Shannon, on. So uh, stay tuned. I'm real happy to announce um, our guest, uh, Randy Shannon, is on with us. Um, she's a network marketer, health consultant, libertarian activist, uh, radio talk show host on a real radio station, uh, the Fox affiliate AM 1050 talk uh, on Our American Cafe uh, with a really big audience uh, one day, and we aspire to have that one day. So anyways, um, uh, the beautiful and the vivacious uh, Randy Shannon. Randy, are you there? I am here, and I'm so glad to be here. A lot of people say it, but I genuinely mean it. So I really just, I love you, and I love Shaleen, and it's just, uh, you guys are like home. This is the family that I love, you know. You're my kind of people. <laughs> so well, I genuinely well, thank you. mean it's that mutual. from my heart. Yes. Well, so, uh, it's mutual. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, that, that first hour, I got on maybe 10, 15 minutes before it was over, and I was listening, and um, gosh, I have... It, everything that was said is so critically important for everyone to know. But, you know, there there is another side because we are still here and we still got to make the best of what we got while we're in it. And, right. Yes. And so I found myself, you know, I, I've really been in this walk for, for quite a long time. And, and my grandfather, he's probably 98 years or something. He's right around there right now. And so when I tell you from the, the time I was a small child, I remember his prayer and I remember him telling me about the different things that would be coming. And, you know, you, uh, you guys have talked about Nibiru, et cetera. And, uh, you know, he told me these things when I was a small child. I'm 47 years old now. And, um, you know, so when I talk to him today, he's still around. And, um, oh, well, you know, that's he's cool. Yeah, he he listens to all kinds of uh, late night radio shows. He, he he can't really see too much anymore. He's he's basically blind for all intents and purposes. And he's a mm -hmm. World War II vet. He had uh, dysentery, so it still battles him today. He still has repercussions from that. He nearly lost his life. Um, wow. I like to tell a story. Um, you know, when cigarettes used to still be cigarettes, now they're all very chemical laden. But when he was a smoker, uh, as a young man. He was a bombardier on, on the airplanes when he was in the war, and he said one time they had to do an emergency landing in one of these countries where uh, cannibals were on the ground. And so they made, <laughs> they made their emergency landing, and they were instantly surrounded by ca uh, cannibals. And everyone was thinking, it's over, except for my grandfather, who was very calm, and uh, he knew he had the Lord on his side. And he, back in those days, they had the white T-shirts, and they would roll up their pack of cigarettes in their, in their sleeve. Right, so right. He, yeah. <laughs> so he said, you know, if this is it, this is it. And he r takes the cigarettes out, and he actually passes them around to some of the cannibals. And everybody was smoking. Nobody could communicate to each other, but he gave the peace offering. And they all stood there and smoked, and the cannibals did not eat them. He's still alive today. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know? that, that, that's yeah, that that's scarier than actually the bombing raid. That that sounds like maybe Papua New Guinea. Was that was that where they? Yes, that's where he was. Very, you're educated on that. Awesome. That's exactly where he was. So yeah, that, that I, may actually have been where he got the dysentery too. I'm not sure. But it could have been, you know, and I I don't know if still to this day if that's still practiced there, but um, it that, that that's you know. That 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 there, there's places on this planet I really don't want to go, and that's in the top five list. I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to go there. You know, it's like I love the tropics. Uh, I'll come down to Florida and hang out with you. That's as tropical as Anytime. I want to get. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime. There's no cannibals down here that I know of. 
So, <laughs> you never Not know. Yet, right? Never know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so his wow. his line was smoking uh, doesn't always kill because that's their tagline. Smoking kills, but actually today's cigarettes, you know, they they do kill a lot more. So, um, so that well, was one of his great topics. Yeah. Wow, that that that's a great story. Well, well, you know, with 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 uh you know back back in those days you know that was standard issue along with your rifle and your mess kit you got uh how you know how many an x amount a number of packs of lucky strikes to go with you um, <laughs> yeah. uh that that was just uh part of part of it um mm-hmm. but that that is fascinating story um, i bet uh, he had all kinds of great stories to tell uh, you know because a lot of guys don't really want to talk about that um i had an uncle and, you know he was a lot older and he was he fought in the south pacific and you know, when uh, I'd go, when we were, my brother and I were small, a lot of times we would go over, it was mainly on Monday nights, my mom would go to circle meetings at her church, and she'd drop us off at Uncle Osborne's house, and mm-hmm. every time we'd go over there, I'd pester him to tell me stories about, you know, the war, and I don't know if he just told me just to shut me up, or if it, he didn't <laughs> mind talking about it, because, uh, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of people, you know, it was very traumatic, and they never got over it, like, it. I had another uncle, same well, he he fought in the European theaters. My my dad's older brother, oldest brother, and um, he didn't he didn't really cope real well. Uh, all I knew of Uncle Henry was Uncle Henry the alcoholic. And then when he passed, and we went to his funeral, you know, the full on twenty one gun salute, flag draped coffin. Wow. Coffin. Then come to find out, all these heroics that um, because I, I think he was over in the Ardennes. I'm not sure, but he was a medic, so he he saw okay. a lot of oh, you know yeah. you know a yeah. lot of the worst a lot of the worst of it. And you know after that, you know I was like, wow, I wish I would have gotten to have known him. But I was real young when he passed. Uh, but yeah, yeah, maybe I'll put you on the phone with my grandfather one day and see if uh, we should do it soon because you know he is 98. But um, there is things that I know for a fact he will not discuss. You know he says he was witness to atrocities galore and Hmm. he doesn't even say whose side it was on. Um, And, and there's a a period of, of time where he absolutely blocks it out. So I have no idea what did happen. Maybe he would be more apt to tell a man than he would his granddaughter, but uh, he definitely has stories. And there's, I mean, there's things that I, you know, I can say on air, but there, I mean, they're a fact of war. Uh, Some things that he has told me, which were pretty horrific. Um, Hmm. Which I, I would be happy to share them, um, but they are they are gruesome, and uh, so if they're gruesome, and he has other stories that are far worse that he will not tell me, so I can't imagine honestly what it could be. Right, but, um, right. It's man's yeah, inhumanity like, to man. It's horrible. It's absolutely horrible. That's why uh, when I was listening to um, all the preparations in in what you just played, it's so critical, and I really do hope that people take it to heart. Um, because, you know, my, my grandfather has told me ever since I had my first son, and I have four, um, and they range from 16 to 26, he has talked to me about war and what, and, and, you know, now it's just like hitting me right now. I wonder if what he said to me is something that he witnessed. He said to me um, about standing strong in your faith and not wavering, what if you saw the enemy taking your, your child, and he would say this when my, when my sons were just infants, and hung them upside down and were torturing them in their genitals. So I, it makes me wonder if that's what he witnessed as well that he's not telling me about. But he wanted to make sure that I would be unwavering because we will see the worst of the worst. Like mankind can be absolutely horrific. And, and here's been my take on this for years, and I don't understand why it's not common sense. If we send our boys over to these other countries, and we, we have, like, our, not we, because I don't claim this, but when, when they go over there and they are causing damage, killing innocent uh, life, et cetera, et cetera, and government has told us they are the enemy, what is to stop them from when they come over here and their government told them, oh, we're the enemy? I mean, we have been made out to be the enemy to the world. So do we yeah. think that they're going to be any kinder to us the day they show up on our soil, which, you know, hey, they're probably already on our soil according to the numbers of people that Obama's let in this country. I, so, I know, right? Yeah, and I think they're just waiting. I, literally, the gym I go to, I point out a couple of the guys in the gym to my sons and to their friends, and I, I call them and I say, you see that guy over there? He's Al-Qaeda. Like, I literally point guys out that I think the moment that they got their heads all wrapped up in the turban, they would pass for that. And they are working out and working out and working out, and they're unsociable. Um, so they could be it. They could be preparing, and they will wreak havoc. And I think that they're already walking amongst us, to be honest. I, I'm, 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 I'm with you. I, I mean, you know, the, the, you know, the, 
the immigration system as a whole, but uh, you know, in particular, the southern border has gone unchecked for so many years that yeah. there's no telling who has has come over here. Uh, I mean, when you look back uh, historically, like within the past century, our government, and, and you know, you can attribute it to the Albert Pike letters if you believe that, uh, you know, the elite, the Illuminati, Bilderberg Group, Trilateral Commission, you know, the usual suspects as to why they want to. Want the, want to, they, they want to let this happen and, um, and, and, and have our country become infiltrated with these types of people. Um, I, I mean, the, the CIA and our government has been meddling in the affairs of these other countries for, geez, almost 100 years now. No wonder a lot of them are pissed off. I, I would be pissed yeah. off, too, if, if there was somebody <laughs> from another understand. country. Yeah, why, why, why does anybody still send their son or daughter off to the military right now? pull back and then they have nothing. I mean, it, but you and I, we do our best, but we're still not getting to the masses. So then there's all these other radio shows that pop up, which is great. And then there's the Fox affiliate one that we do on Saturday uh, mornings, you know, so we, we do talk about it, but honestly, two of the two, two people on that show have already been visited by the feds. So like we have to be, we, we, it's not that we don't believe everything that like you and I can say on this program that we can't say on the other one because they get visited by the feds. So they do have their squashers of the truth. They're out there. I, I, I can yeah. attest to this. No, oh, trust me. I know. Um, you know, it, it's like, you know, freedom of speech. <laughs> That's an illusion. I mean, I know. It I, is an I, illusion. Yeah. I spent six is. months in the LA County gulag system uh, for freedom for first and second amendment I- issues. So I trust me, hon, I lived it. I know. Yeah. And, I didn't even do anything, you know, in this day and age, you know, especially with the passage of the Patriot Act, you mm-hmm. don't have to do or say anything. All it takes is for somebody to accuse you of doing something. And, you know, what what we were taught in school, that whole um, innocent until proven guilty, that's a total crock. You, the onus is on you to prove your innocence. Uh, you're guilty until proven innocent. And that's just a fact of life. I mean, we've got the largest popula- prison population on the planet. And, yeah, there, there's a lot of, uh, you know, scumbags that deserve to be in prison, but – there, there. I firmly believe there, there are a lot of innocent people that are in prison. Oh, I do um, too. It's sad. For you know bogus reasons or you know uh, complete fabrications and lies, and you can tie it into the prison for profit industry too. But there's a political aspect outside of the 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 money aspect of it as well. And you know it's like you know your your, your granddad says you know you, you can't waver from your faith because. Whether you believe we're in the end zone of the end times or not, I mean, uh, you know, just look around with, you know, and when you think about the Bible, um, a book that was written, you know, how long ago and everything that was written in that book, you see it playing out in real life when you walk out your front door. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Uh, uh, and especially, you know, with the persecution of uh, Christians in this country nowadays. Um, I mean, I ain't no saint, and, you know, I'm honest, I don't go to church a lot, uh, but. <laughs> You know, with what's happening to these people, uh, you know, turn, you can flip through about the Bible and you can find something that, you know, predicted, well, this is going to happen uh, during this particular moment in history or however you want to put it. And, you know, you, you're exactly right. Uh, you know, these, these people, they're here, they're training. I mean, like, um, you, no matter what you believe, as far as like what happened on September the 11th, those guys are here for a long time. And, didn't raise any red flags when, you know, their visas expired. No red flags were raised that, you know, they went to flight school. Well, I don't want to learn how to land a plane. I just want to learn how to fly a plane. I would That would send off some some pretty serious alarm bells in my head if somebody told me that. I would be like, hey, wait, why does he don't want to learn how to land? That, that's the most important aspect of flying and driving is the ability to stop. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Oh man, uh, you're 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 absolutely right on. Okay, um, sorry, somebody walked in right as right as we were talking. Um, yeah, I just I don't I don't know where it's all going to play out. Uh, if you if you do go according to the word, then I mean we we already know just how soon is that going to flood in. So that's why I I mean I guess when I heard the first part of your show, I decided and and I saw what the topic was going to be. I thought you know what people need to have. A positive side, too. It's not all bad, and we do need to – because it, it may not be tomorrow. So it may not be a year from now. So we got to make the most of it while we can. Right. And, you know, when I listen to that too much, then – and not listen, but when I start talking about it and, and I 
I like kind of crumple up and don't live life near as much. Um, it just kind of reminds me of like when I was married. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know. No, I've been there. That's example, right? <laughs> right. I, 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 I've lived it. I know. <laughs> yeah, it's like, right. leave me alone. Okay. I don't want to go home. <laughs> So when you got out of a bad marriage, then things kind of lightened up. And, you know, that's why I kind of wanted to give people some hope and give them some things to reach for. And right. you, did a, you did an awesome job laying that all out. And yeah, I did an everyone, awesome job of bringing everybody down. So now it's your job to bring everybody back up. Bring everybody Positivity. Okay. <laughs> well, every single move that we make, it counts in one way or another. You know, and think about it. You're, you are only as strong as your commitments. Think about the relationships. Uh, your business relationships, you know, churches, whatever, whatever it is. So, so for starters, let's just use the Bible as an example. So in John, and I never really taught Bible, but there's a couple of things. I heard this message, and I wanted to kind of relay it. In, in John 6, 50, it says, This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. So there's commitment. That's what he's basically saying. Do this, not going to die. There's commitment. All things pertaining to life and godliness for sinners of every nation. I don't really like to say sinners because, you know, it says that he, he doesn't interact with the dark. So um, who repent and believe in him will not die, period. So there's the commitment. The church is only as strong as the commitment. The stronger you are, the more committed you are. If you go to the church and you don't commit, you have no right to expect anything, maybe. It's, like, it's kind of like a bank account, and you can't withdraw out of the bank account if you don't deposit, right? So right. if we don't commit, then you can't receive, so you, your commitment will set free the blessings that you are having on hold right now. And that can be, you know, I'm, I'm relating it to the church right now, but I'm going to relate it to everything else here in a minute. So in John, now this is what struck me. I'd never seen this before. <laughs> John 6, 66. Interesting, right? 66 yeah. right there. Okay. So you go to that verse in Scripture, and, it's, and many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. That's what it says. So in 650, he talked about commitment, do this, and we're committed. But in 666, a bunch of them left, and they had no more commitment. And so he, he lost those. Those were the quitters, the non-committers, et cetera. So then in John 6, 67, he says to the last 12, will ye also go away? In other words, he's not changing his ways. It's his way or the highway. It's going to be done right even if he's the last man standing. So he, he's saying, hey, you going to go too? If so, that's fine. <laughs> go, because I'm not going to change. He's not going to change his standards, and we can't change our standards either. So you're either with it or get off the train. So then in John 6:68, 6, Simon Peter answered him back and said, to whom shall we go? And in, basically in translation, that means you're the best, there's none better. So now let's relate that to life. Not that that's not, but I'm just saying. That's, that is talking about commitment. I'm not going to change my standards. You're either with me or get the hell out of the way. And I probably shouldn't use that word when I'm talking scripture, but that's the bottom line. With me or get out of the way. So we all want the best. We want the best commitments. We want the best standards. We want the best relationships. We want the best quality of life, especially in the times that we're in. So what do we do with it? We put this into life now, like in our relationships right now, in our businesses now, or our job, or about just being a great American and standing now. What do we see all over in the politics? We see a bunch of weasels, a bunch of spineless, worthless criminals not standing. What do we see at the county level? What do we see uh, in the banks? This is all we see is just low, 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 worthless, spineless, standard, non-committing types of people. And we have to mm -hmm. interact with that all day long. I literally, Randy, which in case the audience didn't get it, there's two Randys on today. <laughs> um, I know. Right? So that's, that's just a good thing right there. Um, I know. We got the coolest names. <laughs> exactly. So I wake up literally happy every single day. And then I go out into the world, and then I run into all these people that are sleepers, they don't care, they – like that he just put out the lowest, most minimal effort all around me. And so, you know, my kids are like, Mom, you're so amazing in business. You're this, you're that, you're so high energy. You're... Like my kids like think that it's so great because they now are going out into the world and they're experiencing this lack all around them. So we have to put this into life right now. And, and people either are committed 
or they're not. It's, it's one way or another. So take your job, for an example, or if you're a business owner, which I am. I do traditional business. I do network marketing. Uh, I don't take it lightly. I put my heart into everything. I will work 18-hour days. I will work 24-hour days if that's what it takes. I don't care. Sleep can come. I will get it another day. If something needs to be done, I commit. So the other part of that equation is if it's not what you love, then it's not right. Go out and replace it. So if it's a job, get a different job. Get something that you love. All the money in the world isn't worth losing your happiness over it. So get something you enjoy doing, and then it's priceless, literally. Yeah. You're right, you know, and 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 our guest last night, he said that same thing, and you know, it, um, I'm sure you've heard this saying too. It, you know, when you are doing what you love and you're getting paid for it, you, you never work another day in your life. You know, the, the, a man, yeah. a woman's hobby becomes your job, then you never work another day in your life. And you know, what's better than that? Uh, I mean, it don't get much better, my, uh, you know. I, I I so agree. So I, you know, I could take on some other projects right now but they don't taste good to me in the sense that I don't see myself being happy taking on some of these other projects. In the last week I was asked to invest in something. I'm not hopping on that because I can't see feeling really good about it. And and even if it made me a bunch of money, I'd have, what I would lose was far greater. I would have to be worrying about tracking my money. I'd have to be worrying about what's flying out the door the wrong way. I just, I can't do those kinds of things. Or if I know that there's a project that I could take on that could be extremely lucrative but I'm dealing with flaky people who are not uh, reliable, then it's not worth the headache to me, and I won't touch it, or I will back out of it. I don't blame you, and, and you know, and th- this is something that, you know, has been drummed into my head and, and, and yours, too, I'm sure, when, you know, when we first got involved in this type of work that we do, uh, you know, because don't, we don't do just a radio show here. We've got a business. You know, you're, you're not only uh, – you know, branding uh, a product or a service or a company or selling a product, service, or company. You're branding yourself and you're branding uh, and you're selling yourself uh, with the product and service. And if it's not something that you would be proud to represent, you know, why would you want to, you know, do that? Why would you want to recruit, like, say, a friend into that if it's not something, you know, you're you're committed to or you believe in or you see the value in? Why would you do that? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, you know, if if you're not in a job that you don't love or you're you're not a business owner of something that you love, get rid of that and you will relieve all that stress that you're dealing with right now. Start something of your own. You guys are involved in stuff, I'm involved in stuff, and it's fulfilling and it's happy. You know, it's not that there isn't days that, that don't have stress, but okay, so now let's move into the other area which we kind of touched on, relationships. Is it all it can be? Are you giving it your all? If not, start right now. You liked that person at one time, so if it's, you know, if, if it's repairable, repair it. At least give it that 1,000% effort and do it for a few months. And if it doesn't work, then why are you staying in that misery? Get out of it. But, but honestly, genuinely be able to say, yes, I did it all. And, you know, some people will differ with me on that. That's okay. You know, they're going to bring up the Bible. They're going to bring up the Word and say, well, i got to stay in it as long as there's not been adultery. Well, I don't know. I said to somebody tonight that's a friend that is up and down in their marriage, and I said, uh, you know, let's say they're 40 years old and they only get to live to be 60. they got 20 years left. How do you want to live those years? I don't know. I have a – I can't prove it because there's just not enough in the Bible to, to – to, Warranted, I guess, but if I'm absolutely miserable and I gave it my absolute all and I've been abandoned in that marriage, I'm out. Why do you want to give the one and only life you have? So, you know, people can do what they want. What's your thoughts on that, Randy? Well, I I agree. And, uh, you know, I'm no Bible scholar. I I, I know there's – you know, those who say that, um, you know, divorce is uh, highly frowned upon, uh, so I'm – I don't know if that's exactly what it says in the Bible or that's someone's interpretation that they're preaching that it says. But, um, you know, the way, the way I view a relationship and a commit, commitment to that is <clears throat> I see people say, yeah, it takes work. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, it does take work. But, you know, there comes a point to where if both sides aren't bringing equal, uh, an equal amount of um, love and value and commitment and, you know, all the, 
you know, it, you know, putting their all into it. I mean, what's the point? Uh, and, and, you know, if, if we, you know, cause tomorrow's not guaranteed. You, you said like if someone's 40 and they, and they knew they were going to live to 60, why would they spend that last 20 years? I mean, it's like, it, go out and rob a bank and go spend that last 20 years in prison. You know, it's going to be the same thing only, uh, <laughs> you, you don't have any bills to pay. Right. <laughs> um, but I, 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 I guess to my own failings, you know, I, I'd always look for, you know, perfection, you know, and I'm, believe me, I'm far from perfect, uh, but not perfection in a physical way, but just where a relationship was just a, something easy to do. Um, and that, that could be, you know, I could be way off base, you know, where it's like, why do I have to work at wanting work at being with this person when we should just, you know, our souls, bodies, minds, everything just join as one and, we go skipping along our, our merry way for the next uh, till death do us part thing. So I, I don't know. I've, I have, I'm a complete failure at relationships. So I don't, <laughs> I don't have anything good to add, uh, you know, to that, unfortunately. Well, let me throw one other thing in on, on the relationship part. Cause we have a lot of listeners and you know, this gets posted out, you know, your show and stuff gets posted out on social media. I posted it out on different things like Google plus and, Facebook and Twitter, you know, I see porn pictures. Now, I'm a woman, okay, so I look for what the, the males that are in my friends list do. I go look at them, and then I go look to see what their likes are. And if I see them at any way, shape, or form liking porn or pornographic light, you know, type pictures, I block them completely because even that I don't want in my life. And so um, I, I look at those guys. And liking those pictures left, right, and center, I say, why are you doing it? Don't you, don't you want the real woman sitting right next to you? And uh, do you really think that the porn girl is going to give you the time of day? Okay, and so why waste one second of your life on that trash? You can't touch it. You can't feel it. All you can do is look at it. Go lay your wife down and go look at her. You know, way more fulfilling. Go do that, and then your life will get better. So, um, and then there's people, you know, like me who just block them completely. I don't like it. I've blocked tons and tons of friends. Uh, it was part of the downfall of my marriage, and so I want nothing to do with it or a guy who wants anything to do with it. So they literally get blocked. So if, if men, and I can only speak for men because I'm a woman, if men want a good woman, get rid of the, and, and not just porn, but just all the junk stuff out of your life and give all your attention to that relationship, back to commitment, back to high standards, back to wanting the most for you. So what people got to remember is it doesn't matter what they're going through. They need to make no excuses. They need to commit more, serve more, change more, give more, do more, expect more, learn more, all of the above. And if they need to ch change their career, they need to do it and do it right now. What are you waiting for? <laughs> Life, the clock is ticking. And if you love what you do, stick with it. Just give it more. If you're already at that point where you're at that plateau where you're super happy and you don't need to change anything, that's great. But we still have a country falling apart, and they need to just continue to stand and be a better American and be a, a better American through social media, through conversations, through going to groups and having conversations and actually trying to make change. So, and then they need to, you know, not question their commitments just, just because they don't see instant results. Like, look, a lot of people are standing right now in this country, and we're not seeing a ton of great results, but we just have to recommit to, to this every single day to, to what we have, whether it's the relationship, it's the career, it's our country falling apart in shambles. Uh, we have to just wake up and commit to this every single day. And, you know, we gotta, we got to get to the goals in life, quit fooling ourselves uh, without having these commitments because commitment is absolutely required. This is where we're going to grow. So, um, you know, Jim Rohn, uh, he, he, I gave a speech one time. I basically copied his speech for a Toastmasters class because I didn't uh, have the ability to get up in front of a room and speak. I didn't have the ability to get on a radio show and speak. I was very nervous. I was very timid. And I listened to one of his speeches one time, and so I used it for my first speech in the Toastmasters group. And one of the lines that was in it, he said, Bangladesh is hard, America is easy. And we do still have it easy here. We have an uphill battle because we have a lot of factors at, at the head that are trying to destroy this great nation, but there is still so many great, 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 great people, and they're even involved in law enforcement, and they're even involved in the government. And when they stand, this evil head is chopping them, but they still do it. They still do try. They still stand out. I know of police departments right now that are ready 
for a gun grab, and they're not going to do it. I I know of of uh, towns where the cops are hot, as in dirty, I should say. It's probably a better word. And the good towns know about it. What, what they would do to be prepared, I don't know. I don't have that inside information. But, you know, I mean, it's not too hard to find out where the dirty cops are and when crap goes down in this nation, who's going to actually turn on the people and who isn't. It's pretty simple, you know, just look at, see it, who's getting complaints on them and then what is internal affairs doing? Nothing. Look at any big city. Now they might slap a wrist here or there, you know, or an occasional imprisonment of a cop, but, you know, it's not too hard to know where the dirty, dirty cops are in this town. And I'm just using that as an example. So just remember that every single move we make counts in one way or another. Think about it like this. When we wash a car, it doesn't make it run any better to improve its uh, performance. We have to get inside, and that's what I'm talking about here, these commitments and high standards. We in this country, we're, this is such a great nation. We turn lemons into lemonade. We turn weeds into gardens. We turn pennies into fortunes, and it's because we make commitments to do these kinds of things, and we don't need to deal we don't need to, to play with the hand that life deals us. We can change it all, any day, any moment, at any time that you wish. We can do this. So, yeah, I, 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 just, well, I was just going to say I agree. Uh, and when you think about this commitment, um, we we talked about this the week. I believe it was the week before last. Um, the commitment that the founding fathers made when they pledged their lives and their fortunes to each other, when they signed the declaration of independence, you know, there's a lot of guys on there, you know, and Paul Harvey had a beautiful, um, um, there, there was a beautiful video of Paul Harvey naming these guys and what happened to them, you know, like during and after the war for independence and the founding of this nation. And I mean, you know, we know like John Hancock and George Washington, but there's a lot of other guys on there that probably, you know, would have, you would have never heard of had Paul Harvey not mentioned them. And these guys, a lot of them ended up, you know, penniless, broke, because they made that commitment, and their sacrifice gave us this country. And even not even just those guys that signed that document, but, you know, I, I got into an argument with this guy online. It, this is stupid. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but um, it was about the gas tax in North Carolina. And I was like, well, hey, you know, fight tyranny, drive. 30 miles to South Carolina and, you know, the gas is 30 cents a gallon cheaper and you're not, and you're in, and this way you are self defunding uh, the DMV. Well, I don't want to be inconvenienced. That's too far to drive. And I said, you know what? Don't tell me that you go tell that nameless, faceless continental soldier that marched with general Washington 20 miles through the snow with bloody frostbitten feet. This guy you've never heard of in your entire life just to get to the fight. Mm -hmm. um, I was like, he did, he probably didn't want to be inconvenienced either, but he got out and did it. And I'm like, you know, you, you know, and our nation has become so soft and complacent in that way that people won't make that commitment. They, you know, there's too much of, well, let the other guy do it, or I might lose my job, or I might lose my freedom. Well, guess what? If you go through life with that mindset, with what's going on with this government, <laughs> guess what? You know, they're eventually they're going to come for you, or they're going to come for your kids. It, you know, um, you know, we've reached a tipping point, and yeah. it's time to make a stand. And you know, there's little pockets of—I um, wouldn't call them pockets of resistance. I would call them pockets of constitutionality all over this country. And they're starting to make a lot of noise. And what we've tried to do is connect a lot of these people so they can network and work together. And you know, it's been a beautiful thing. Um, and I, I know you know you do as much as you can too with your organization and your activism. So we. You know, we've all got to, like you said, make this commitment. We've got to make it to ourselves, to each other, our families, and our and our country because we ain't got nobody else. We are all each other have um, when it comes to that. And I tell you what, I would rather die on my feet than live on my knees any day of the week. You know, that's just I'm it. Just you. ain't gonna happen. It's not gonna happen. And people have to get that little snap in their head too. No matter what, they gotta be, they gotta commit, and they have to have high standards. And when people start to put those high standards into place, they will take stands and they will not tolerate the bunk that's going on in this country. And I know the listeners on your call, they get it. But maybe this call uh, recording will go far and wide and it will affect somebody for change. And maybe it inspired somebody to stand higher, to stand taller today. You know, you know be leaders, not followers. Be bold, not timid. timid. You know, don't settle. Go for the goals, whatever it is. 
press on when confronted with adversity. And right now, we're all being confronted with adversity. They're killing the middle class. Everything yep. that should be right is wrong. Uh, all the corruption at every single level right now, it is like a, it's an infestation of cockroaches. And yeah. we have to, yeah, we have to stand above this. We have to have high standards. We've got to have commitments to not let the cockroaches seep in. Oh, might that make you a little bit more money if you do the wrong thing? No. Say no to it. Say no to the junk. Don't get so immersed in the sports that you forget what's going on around the country. Don't be willing to give up your rights so easily. Every time I fly, I opt out. I don't want the molestation pat down, but I also don't want the x-ray. So I inconvenience them. At least that's the twist I have going on in my brain for while they're patting me down. And I always talk to those people and say, you know, this is a violation of my Bill of Rights, right? You know, I, I say these things to them. And, you know, I've had TSA agents. Look, it's a job. It's a paycheck for them. And this is where people need to stand. I wish all TSA would walk off the job, but that won't happen because they're getting a paycheck. But I've had TSA. I've had TSA agents say to me, as they're patting me down and they've heard me out, they say, yeah, and they, they're, they're cynical. They say, America, land of the free, right? I mean, they know. They yeah, know they, they know us, Buck. Um, and it makes you wonder, like with, uh, you know, Stalin's secret police, the Stasi of East Germany, the, you know, the Gestapo, if a lot of these people were the same way, they're like, going, I really don't want to be here. I don't want to do this, but it's a paycheck. Or if I don't do this, I'll get shot. And, you know, I've, I've opted out here. And, you know, I, you know, we were talking, you know, last night we were talking about this. I used to love to fly. And so did Shalene. I mean, it was great. And, you know, it was the most efficient way to get from California to North Carolina and back uh, to see my family and after september the 11th i just hate it and i will drive unless i unless i absolutely have to i will not fly period and that's just it i will drive um you know ride my motorcycle whatever to get from a to b the only time i'll fly is if i've got to be somewhere that's way far away and i don't have a lot of time but otherwise screw it i'm driving I, i'm not I'm even going to deal way. with that yeah i've taken more road trips i i went back to the midwest two times just to Iowa and I drove them and that's like almost 24 hours each way. I don't want to do that when I can fly in five hours, but I did it to avoid the molestation. <laughs> I hate it that bad that I would rather put myself in the car for 24 hours and lose the sleep than fly. So I'm like you in prior to, well, actually probably the last year that I flew a lot was right around 2008 and nine. And I flew a lot I mean, every month I was on at least one or two flights for business, and I just completely cut it off in 2010. And it's like what you said. It's a rare, rare, rare moment if I fly. Cannot stand it because yeah. I don't want to go through it. They're, the, a lot of these people are so rude. They treat you like you're absolute trash, and an, an opt-out is like a nightmare. They take your stuff away from you when rule number one is you're not to be separated from your stuff. Uh, so I argue with them all the time on that. And, um, you know, they look at me like, oh, we got – and I've had, I've had an agent, a TSA agent, say that. Oh, we got a troublemaker over here. You know, I'm like, no, I'm not a troublemaker. You're separating me from my stuff. That's, don't you hear it on the speaker? Never be separated from your stuff. So it takes people to stand. And, you know, every time I fly, and you tell me, Randy, when you opt out, are you not the only one around opting out? I never see anyone opt out. No, everyone's just going through like um... – uh, it's like an assembly line at a factory, right? Yeah. And you know, and it's kind of like uh, it was some credit card commercial that used to come on a couple of years ago. Everybody, you know, and they're playing that. There, there's some factory music that used to be played in a cartoon. Um, I don't know the name of it. Uh, I'm not even going to try to hum it, but you know, everybody's playing with a credit card. <laughs> no, I want to hear that. <laughs> I, 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 I can't, I can't remember it all. Dun, 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 something like that, right? Well, all these people are going through the okay. line to pay for their coffee with their credit card, right? And then the mm -hmm. one schlub shows up with cash, and everything stops, and everybody's pissed off at this guy because he's paying in cash instead of a credit card. And, you know, we've talked about the cashless society for a long time, and um, well, not for a long time, but a lot on the show, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, that's the one guy, the troublemaker, the individual who is using legal tender as opposed to, you know, swiping a piece of plastic through a, through an electronic scanner that the government can trace. Oh, well, so-and-so bought a cup of, you know, bought a cup of coffee with creamer and sugar at 8 o'clock in the morning at the 7-Eleven, whereas, you know, 
the guy paying in cash, they don't have a record of, well, this guy bought a, you know, a large cup of coffee with, uh, with half and half and, um, sweet and low at the seven 11 at, uh, eight Oh one. They don't have the record of that. And, you know, and it, it, it's, you know, and it's propaganda, you know, I'm looking back going, I'm paying in cash, you know, to hell with it. Um, and you know, the, you know, there, there's all sorts of ways to opt out, all sorts of ways to fight back, you know, and we, we were talking about this, you know, it's like, you know, Chris Rock, I don't really like that guy. I think he's an ass. But one thing he said that I agree with is we don't pay taxes. They take taxes. Well, if the entire country, if you're paid on like a W-2, file exempt, you will immediately defund the federal government. If everyone filed exempt, no income taxes are being taken out of. And what the hell are they going to do, throw us all in jail? I don't think right. so. Right. It's called standing together. You're absolutely right. Like, I don't know if you saw it yesterday, but I wrote a letter to um, – what was the restaurant? Uh, Olive Garden. They sent me a, a coupon to come into the restaurant because, you know, clearly I haven't been there in a long time. And this is what I wrote them. I said, we stopped eating genetically, your genetically modified food a while back. When you clean it up and learn the facts that GMO food causes cancers and tumors and death, then maybe you'll change the whole path and take care of your customers. Until then, we go to organic non-GMO places to eat. There are a lot of places that got it long before you. What exactly are you waiting for? And I included a list of 400, rest, well, 400 organic non-genetically modified food makers. Some are restaurants, some aren't. And mm-hmm. that got shared uh, all over Facebook, got lots of likes, got some comments. The point is this. It's, it was a one-paragraph letter. Everyone can write that. I stopped, and so did my kids. We stopped supporting all of the restaurants around here that eat the, or that serve the poison food. So if everyone in mass stopped going out to eat and just bought organic, that would stop the whole genetically modified food chain in a day. Yeah, it would. Yeah, I mean, and, and it's not the same as well. Don't buy gas on Tuesday to to screw the gas, the oil companies. No, they, you know. Um, Gas isn't going to go bad because nobody bought it that day. It'll still be good tomorrow, but, you know, this gen- genetically modified garbage they're trying to pass off as food, it's got a shelf life, and they're going to be sitting on a lot of smelly inventory, and they might get the message, hey, you know what, we, you know, and I agree with you. It's like go to your local farmer's market. Find a butcher, yeah. a local butcher with locally sourced um, uh, in, um, not produce, but locally sourced uh, livestock. That's the word I'm looking for. Uh, instead of buying all this crap at the grocery store or whatever and and learn to grow your own uh, stuff, you know, and whether your stupid city says you can or not, grow your own vegetables. What are they going to do? You know, if the whole city grows vegetables, well, this piece of paper says you're not supposed to grow vegetables and we're going to send the police to your house. Well, if everybody in the city's doing it, then what are what, is the police going to spend, you know, spend all those resources going to everybody's house trying to arrest them? I mean, you're going to end up with a big, you're going to end up with a revolution on your hands, uh, you know, um, you know, and the same thing with like collecting your own rainwater and stuff. You know, if everybody would tell these idiots or these criminals mm-hmm. that wear suits and robes, no, your law, it, the, the, what you wrote on that piece of paper is not law. We will not comply. You know, that that's kind of like my motto. I will not conform. I will not comply. I'm a long haired, tatted out, sleeved out, guitar playing, motorcycle riding um, entrepreneur, and I'm not going to conform. I ain't cutting my hair. I ain't. You know, going to work in a corporate office wearing a suit and tie. I'm, I'm, I'm a t-shirt and jeans and uh, boots type of guy. <laughs> you know, that's just it. Exactly. Yeah. By the way, on the garden thing, and you're right. And and see, there is victories when people have high standards and they commit to things. I did an interview with Dr. Edward Group. He he uh, started founded the the Global Healing Center. Mm-hmm. He's a guy that uh, several years ago. He's a former military, by the way, and then he went into chiropractic medicine. He's a doctor. The feds went in because he was curing people of cancer. So the feds went in and raided him, took all of his patients' uh, folders, and they told him to his face that they burned them. So he was never getting his patients' folders back. And they also told him directly to his face that there will never be a cure cure allowed for cancer. Yeah, it's big business. I mean, they go out of business. And, you know, we were talking, you know, and that's – like the the little Amish girl, you know, she went. Their family fled overseas. She's cured and, because they didn't want to take chemotherapy. And uh, now the girls, she's fine. And now they're trying to figure out how to get back in the country. And I was like, oh, sneak up through Mexico or uh, own a <laughs> right or, to, 
Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, they'll roll out red carpet for you and just make your way back to uh, Amish yeah, country. You're, or, you're cured now. What are you going to do? Have to have to take the chemo now? I don't. I hope well, not. No, but, they what they no what they wanted to do was make her take preventative chemo. It's like we oh couldn't get the God. poison in you this way. Well, we're going to try to get it into you that way. And I'm like, you know yeah. what? The people that that told them that they need to be strung up. You know, straight exactly. up. Exactly. You know, yeah. for those people. Well, um, I can tell you, according to Dr. Edward Group, he said. So this is a testimony to the people standing. Thank God people are standing and making commitments to stand. He said in the last year, over 800,000 new organic gardens went in. That's a lot of new gardens. That's a lot of breaking away from the grocery store poison, from the farmer's poison, uh, from, from uh, you know, Monsanto. Oh, yeah. it's, a big, it's a good size breakaway. And I'm hearing, right. uh, and maybe you know more on it, that some of these McDonald's are closing up because they're not – you know, getting the business that they used to, which, you know, I don't know why they wouldn't because there's still a sector that's always going to go there, but Mm -hmm. cheap food. But, um, you know, all people have to do is look at the studies. Monsanto only did a three-month study on the corn, but a Sweden university took it four months and beyond, and 100% of the rats died of cancers. Well, 85% died of cancers, tumors, cysts. Uh, Monsanto tried to debunk it, but this university used Monsanto's corn. And I don't know if I said this when I was on your program before, but when I was in the Midwest, this is a factual story. I witnessed it with my own eyes. I had free-range chickens that me and the kids raised from, from just – they were three days old. And uh-huh. we, they were free-range. So, you know, while they were just tiny, we grain-fed them. But as soon as they could be eating the bugs and the grass, we just let them go. And every day they went out, they ate all the bugs, they ate the ants, they ate the flies, they ate everything they could get their, their, their mouths on. They ate the grass. <laughs> And then here's the thing. It was in Iowa. So the farmers all had their corn in the field. And when they finally took it out in the fall, when they take that grain out of the field, a lot of it will drop to the ground. It doesn't make it to the truck. And so our chickens, all the wildlife, think about this. The deer, the birds, everything go out there. The raccoons, the possums, all went out there and ate that grain on the ground. Well, when my chickens laid eggs after that, the eggs had no hard outer shell. I saw it with my own eyes. So if they didn't have a hard outer shell, what is happening to our children having children? They're 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 having spontaneous abortions. They're not carrying these babies to term. They're uh, being born with all kinds of health issues. Um, You know, people one out of three people are getting cancer now. Why people are not stopping and asking why? We know why, and so we have to take stands. We have to take commitments. We have to educate. We have to make our relationships strong. You know, I was telling somebody today. I was driving down the road, and I went through a construction zone. <laughs> it was Did you a short get cut, okay? <laughs> I, I, no, I had the windows up, so I don't know. But <laughs> I, it was a shortcut, so I thought, okay, great, I'm, I'm going to avoid all this traffic. So I go through that, and what did I do? I ran over a bolt. The bolt went into my tire, and these are very, you know, it's a, it's a 2014 Jeep. It's a nice truck, nice tires. Everything is beautiful. And uh-huh. all of a sudden, this alarm goes off on the inside of the car, and the front tire is at a 40 PSI, and the back tire is at a 29. It's, and then before, I like barely made it to the driveway, and it's at a 26. And I can hear the air just, just flowing out, and I can right. see the bolt. I still was happy, Randy. I don't care. I'm not going to let any of that stuff get to me because my commitment is to being happy. And even when junk gets thrown at me, I'm still going to be happy. Whatever. Right. <laughs> yeah, you just throw a patch, you know, pull the bolt out and throw a patch on it and fill it back up. A uh, subject that... I find absolutely fascinating, and I hope that you do too, is the theory of Planet X, Nibiru, and Wormwood. Now, worm, as you know, uh, in the Bible, Wormwood is a it, it's mentioned in Revel, the book of Revelations, actually. Uh, and uh, it's a translation. Uh, I guess it is from, the, it's from Greek, the, the Greek text is Absinthos, Absinthos. And that translates into English as wormwood, and uh, that's the English language version of the Bible. And there, there are other, you know, other languages have uh, like Hebrew in the Old Testament, uh, la la ana, which means curse, and that um, means the same thing in Arabic and Hebrew. Now, the the only clear reference that the the name in, that this named entity occurs in the New Testament is in the Book of Revelations. And uh, the the quote is, the third angel sounded his trumpet, and a great star blazing like a torch fell from the sky on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. 
A third of the waters turned bitter, and many people died from the waters that had become bitter. And that's uh, in Revelation, Revelations 8, 10, and 11. Now, that could be that that can mean a lot of things. Uh, you know, there I've heard people mean I, I've heard it being interpreted as well back when I was growing up uh, during the uh, I don't know if you'd call it the height of the Cold War or as the Cold War was winding down in the 60s and 70s. Uh, a lot of people thought that meant you know ICBMs coming from the Soviet Union. You know, the mutually assured destruction. You know, we launch, they launch, they launch, uh, we launch, and uh, the whole world uh, gets annihilated uh, in thermonuclear war. And so that that could be one uh, person's interpretation of a great star falling from the sky. Others could be a meteorite, a comet, an asteroid. Could be a spaceship, like a giant kamikaze spaceship. You know, who knows? There's there's a lot of different, and that that can be interpreted in a lot of different ways, but you know, something falling from the sky uh, and turn the waters bitter doesn't necessarily mean, I mean, it could mean it poisoned the water. Um, I mean, if, if you've seen, seen the movies and sometimes you come, you wonder, has Hollywood been conditioning us with like the, the movies with the alien invasions and occupation of planet earth, um, movies like Armageddon and deep impact where uh, these giant asteroids and comets uh, basically were going to cause an extinction level event and, you know, well, only in Hollywood could something like that be averted. Um, in real life, I don't think I don't think so. And you know, depending on your your school of uh, beliefs, no one knows who's right. No one knows who's wrong. Could have been created six thousand years ago. Uh, the universe could be six thousand years old, or it could be billions of years old. Who knows? Who knows what really wiped out the dinosaurs? The the prevailing theory, and let me stress that word theory is. Uh, you know, the, before they discovered the crater down on the Yucatan Peninsula, the prevailing belief was that they died from, I think, volcanic eruptions. And then the prevailing theory once that that, that giant crater had been discovered was that um, an asteroid had hit the Earth some 65 million years ago, and that wiped out the dinosaurs. <clears throat> and uh, all you got to do is look at the surface of the moon, and you can see there it's been hit by a lot of things and or that could be have been old volcanic eruptions who knows for sure what uh, none of us are really there to see it <laughs> so who knows what the truth is but doing my research I, I wanted to not use my speculation and observation uh, because you know I'm just saying I dabble in astronomy because you know it's just fascinating to me but anyways I wanted to you know read through different different publications and sites and try to find something you know that I would basically say would be you know compelling uh and this this one this this one article I found is on a site called krschannel.com and it says does planet Nibiru exist and is Nibiru approaching uh we've all heard the well I don't know if we all have but you know a lot of people have heard you know that this could be happening, but anyways, uh, th this is what they have to say about it. The, the new information on Nibiru is more mysterious than its own origins. Not too many people know the true details of Nibiru and why it exists in our solar system. Uh, so this, the author uh, basically wants to give you some information. And let me tell you some basics first about this planet. Planet Nibiru, which was referred by the Sumerians as Planet X, was supposedly the 12th planet in our solar system. And the true meaning of planet Nibiru is planet of crossing. In the hydrophilic of the Sumerians and Egyptian, they talked about how planet Nibiru had an elliptical orbit, had an elliptical orbit uh, as opposed to our normal horizontal orbit. And it took around 750,000 years to come between Mars and Jupiter. And when it did, it created this, the, this created devastation on all the planets during its flyby. Uh, archaeologists Zachariah Sitchin and Burak Eldam also suggested that this planet which looks a lot like CR-105 uh, with the similar orbit. However, the crossing path of CR-105 is very different than Nibiru or planet X. Nibiru's 80% of orbit lies much further from the sun, where CR-105's orbit is 60% away from the sun and 40% near, uh, near the rest of the planets. And according to historians, uh, Tiamat, Tiamat, a planet which had lain between Mars and Jupiter, 
around 500 to 10 million years ago was a victim of Planet X as Tiamat collided with one of the moons of Nibiru. It crashed, broke into half, and as, and as one half became the asteroid belt, the other half became Phobos, uh, Mars, uh, uh, the moon of Mars. And uh, the, while the other half is our home, planet Earth, out of destruction comes life. And that's a quote from a Hindu ancient text, um, Bhagavad Gita. Now, this planet has known to be, and you know, it depends on who you ask, uh, 20 times bigger than Ju Jupiter with a burning moon, which acts like Nibiru's personal sun. And since Nibiru goes much further away from our sun, the theory actually makes sense and stands out. Uh, the, Anu, the Anunnaki, who are supposedly citizens of Nibiru, came to planet Earth around 25,000 years ago and gave a lot of knowledge and detail to the developing humanoids, whom at the time didn't have the brain capacity or thinking power to comprehend what the Anun Anunnaki were saying. Uh, even the Mayans had predicted the existence of Nibiru, uh, and according to them, a certain dark energy in the shape of a planet which would be coming near Earth in the distant future. And every time this planet came around, entire, the entire civilization of Earth was wiped out. Now, James McCaney, as an expert on planet Nibiru and, the Mayan, his, and Mayan history, explained that around 10,000 years ago, major devastation occurred, which which uh, destroyed many of the civilizations on our planet. And he also explained how ruined cities in South America were banished, um, not because of war or plague, but major physical destruction here on Earth. And he also went on to say that before Nibiru passed by us 10,000 years ago, the North Pole was somewhere in the state of Wisconsin, while the South Pole was somewhere in the Pacific Ocean. Now, if he's right, and this event did occur because of Planet X or Nibiru, then we shouldn't worry about it for the next 740,000 years or so, right? Well, no. Even as Nibiru crossed its path from between Jupiter and Mars, uh, it's now surging upwards to make its longest route around the sun, and that's due to the fact that its elliptical orbit goes in a roundabout very close to the sun on one end, while 80% of orbit is really far away from the sun, and that's why the earthquake that is why the earthquake that happened in Japan and Chile and other places could be due to the fact that the magnetic pull from Nibiru is increasing as it nears our plane, and the pull from Nibiru will increase gravitational force of each planet in, like, in a rubber band type effect, uh, so, and, and you're not going to find this on Wikipedia, but as far as the, the Mayan 2012 doomsday theory is concerned, um, well, it's 2015, so that didn't happen. Uh, but uh, anyways, um, you know, Nibiru will not be showing up this fast because even though the earthquakes are happening and floods are taking place, like what happened in Japan a couple of years ago, it's still a good 10 years away where the naked eye can detect it. And now, while, now as that, with that being said, I, I saw some video footage of um, what appeared to be like two suns and why I never saw this actually. I mean, well, it, it happened like, you know, right at sun up, and well, m most of the time I'm asleep uh, at sun up because I work really late at night, so I got to rest. But you know, that's one theory of of that. I mean, again, we don't know if this is true or not. You know, I've listened to a lot of you know, I listen to coast to coast AM a lot um, back in the '90s and early 2000s when I was doing a lot of. Um, a lot of a lot of shows, and you know, I would be getting back from shows really late at night, uh, the studio really late at night, or you know, rehearsals really late at night. And I listened to Coast to Coast AM, and it was fascinating. And I became a fan of the show, and I still am. So there, there's a lot of um, to me, it's fascinating. Other people, I, I may have put people to sleep. Uh, I may have scared the living daylights out of you. Uh, don't let that happen because none of we don't know if this is true or not. I mean, everyone has to make their own draw your own conclusions and do your own research. I always say that. Don't don't take my word for it because I'm not an expert at anything. Uh, but, you know, I do have some audio uh, to, you know, to kind of back up what I'm saying there. And again, all of this information will be posted on our website, thewakeupmissionshow.com, and on our Facebook page, uh, The Wake Up Mission Radio Show. So if you want to check these links out later, uh, feel free to do so. Do your own research. Draw your own conclusions. It could be true, and then again, it might not be. You know, who the hell knows? Well, if it is, you know, we'll all find out together. But anyways, I, I do have some audio, and, and 
uh, most of the audio that I found, you know, were really long, you know, like two hours and stuff like that. Well, we don't have two hours and those files are too large to upload anyway. So I just had to sit, you know, sift through a lot of different audio to find what, what I thought was good quality audio that would actually fit into our time frame. So we'll, we'll go ahead and uh, get started on this one. Uh, I want to stop uh, the audio uh, to just clarify these dates. They didn't specify the year. And if it was this year or last year, well, it didn't happen, and this is all just speculation. But I did want to – I had put that in my notes also to make sure I clarified that. So uh, we'll go ahead and uh, um, let this continue. Well, it's not well, well, that ain't that a pain. Well, it won't let me advance the recording. I guess it doesn't have a pause. It's just stop, and then it resets. Well, anyways – I, while during my research on this, I, f I found this fascinating um, interview with this guy. Uh, he, he, li he lived in uh, Puerto Rico, and he, he claimed to have been um, abducted by aliens, and, and they had uh, given him a pretty dire warning, and I, I thought this was really fascinating. So let's, let's go ahead and get to this one. I'm going to now this one. It's a little longer, and I'm going to go ahead and let this play. I'm not going to stop it because, uh, well, <laughs> we just saw what happened. Once it stopped, it stops. You can't. It doesn't pause. On the morning of May 14, 1988, Amori Riviera, a young man from Puerto Rico, photographed a giant disc, followed and circled by two jet interceptors. What makes the sensational pictures even more interesting is Riviera's claim that he had contact with the occupants of this UFO. Hello, my name is uh, Amaudi Rivera. Este, I live in Puerto Rico. And back in 1988, 